Good morning, church. I invite you to turn your Bibles or your phones, whatever you use to look at God's Word, to Psalm 51. We'll be getting there in a few minutes. Uh, this will be the last psalm that we look at for this study. And in a lot of ways, I think it's, it's fitting. Because of, when I look at all the psalms that David wrote, probably the second most powerful one is found in Psalm 51. But to set the story so that you understand how we get to Psalm 51, God has come to Samuel, and he's told Samuel, he said, look, you know I've rejected Saul as being king. So we get up and quit mourning and weeping about the fact that he's no longer going to be king. And I want you to go down to Bethlehem. And specifically, I want you to, to find the household of Jesse. Because you see, that's where my next king is coming from. Now, Samuel reacted much like Jonah when God told him to go to Nineveh. Samuel said, wait a minute, Lord. If I go down to Bethlehem, Saul's going to find out, and he's going to come after it, and he's going to kill me. But God says, it's all right, I'll take care of it. And so he says, you take a heifer and you go down to Bethlehem and you tell them, here, you're to, you're to sacrifice. You're going to have a feast. And I specifically want you to invite Jesse and his sons to this feast. And so he does. He goes down there, and of course the elders of the town come out and say, whoa, here's Samuel, must be trouble. Of course, Samuel says, no, I'm here. I'm here to sacrifice. You don't have to worry. I said, oh, 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 okay, that's good. And so they do. They did have the feast. Samuel sacrifices the heifer. And he has seven sons of Jesse pass by him. And one by one, they pass by Samuel, and God says, nope, not this one. Nope, not this one. Nope, not this one. Seven times. No. Nope. And so Samuel looks at Jesse and says, well, is this all your son? And Jesse says, well, well I've got one more. He's, he's out tending the sheep. He's not important. He's just out there keeping the sheep. Samuel says, no, look, you bring him here. You bring that boy here. And as soon as he walks in amongst his brothers and his father, God says, he's the one. He's the one. Rise up, anoint him. He's going to be the successor. He's the man after my own heart. And so when you fast forward, obviously David doesn't become king right away. In fact, David doesn't become king until Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle. And then eventually David is brought to unite Judah and Israel together again as one nation. And as he becomes king, David often, as he did, went into battle fighting to preserve the safety and security of Israel. But as he got older, he decided, well, it was maybe best that I not go out in battle anymore. And so he stays after and he sends his warriors with Joab. And one of these times when he sends them out with Joab, David happens to walk on the top of his palace roof. He looks down and he sees this beautiful woman bathing. He says, wow, who is that? And he sends word, who, who, who is this woman that's, that's, that's bathing that I can look down and see from my palace roof? And they tell David, well, that's, that's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And he sends for her. And as the story goes, he sleeps with her, commits adultery with her. And after a period of time, she goes back to her house. And she sends word to David a little bit later and says, David, I'm pregnant. Now, David obviously doesn't, doesn't like the situation that he's created here. And so he thinks he can, he can cover it up. He thinks that, that, oh, I can take care of this 
so no one will know that that baby is mine. And so what does he do? He sends for Uriah the Hittite. He brings him back from battle. Now keep in mind, Uriah is not just a warrior. He's one of the mighty men of David. These were special warriors. These were the elite of all the warriors for David. And he sends for him and he says, bring him back. And, and he, he says to Uriah, oh, oh, you know, you need to go down and be with your wife. And of course, Uriah refuses. And David has, has a feast for him. Tries to get, he gets him drunk and, and, and says, oh, yeah, I know, I know he'll go down now. Still refuses. And so what does David do? He steals a note for Joab, sends it back through Uriah, and says, I want you to put Uriah up in the very front. And I want you, when you put him in the very front of the fiercest battle, I, then, I want you then to pull back. Because he wanted Uriah dead. And Uriah did die. Now, David then takes Bathsheba after a period of her mourning to be his wife. And of course, David's thinking, well, okay, it's, it's, it's settled, it's all over. And of course, as you saw in our scripture reading there in 2 Samuel, Nathan the prophet comes to him and tells him, a story about a rich man exploiting a poor man. And of course, it was the story of what he had done with Uriah. And so David's response was obviously, that man needs to die. How far be it that that man could, could do such a thing? He should have to pay back fourfold, and he should be killed. And of course, Nathan looks at him and says, that's you, David. You're the man. You're the man that, that did that. And he goes on to explain a little bit more. And we didn't read this part of the scripture, but, but towards the end of that, after Nathan has told him, he said, look, you're not going to die. God's not going to take your life. But he is going to punish you. You are going to have a lot of consequences. The sword will never leave your family. And David responds very simply, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. And hence, that's the background for Psalm 51. And what David penned in Psalm 51 after Nathan had come to him. So bring out the first slide, please. Look at his response. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. You see, David's first appeal after he's told Nathan he sinned, he says, Have mercy on me, God. Blot out the things that I have done. He's appealing for the forgiveness, for the, the compassion for his transgressions because, you see, David understands he can't do anything to earn God's forgiveness. He can't do anything to blot out these transgressions on his own. He tried. He tried. He thought he had control of it. He tried to hide it, but God said no. And he says, Blot those out. Let's continue in the next slide. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Next slide, please. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you're right in your verdict and justified when you judge. You see, David made no excuses. He didn't blame anyone else for what he had done. 
He owned that he had sinned against God. He owned the fact that it was his choice to do what he did. He didn't put the blame on Bathsheba. He didn't put the blame on Uriah. He owned it and said, against you, Lord, and only you have I sinned. So he realizes that in order to be pure, in order to have his transgressions blotted out, he had to acknowledge what he had done. He had to confess before his God that, it, that he had sinned and it was his sin. Go to the next slide, please. You desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. In the next slide, please. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquity. David was reminded about the wisdom God had instilled in him from his mother's womb. He's reminded that it's God's wisdom that he needs rekindled in his life in order to make the change he needs to do. When he says, clean me with hyssop, hyssop was a plant that they commonly used to do ceremonial cleaning with. David is not talking about take this hyssop and wash his body. He's talking about take this hyssop and clean my heart. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. And again, David is not talking about his physical body. He's talking about that heart, that heart that became so selfish to seek out to please his own self. That's what David is saying. Wash that out, Father. Remember, he was called a man after God's own heart. And so he's asking God, Wash this heart. Cleanse this heart. Blot out my transgressions. Then let's go to the next slide. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast love or spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. See, after David appeals for God to cleanse his heart, he knows he's got to have something to replace it. He's not talking about a physical transplant where he would, God would literally cut his heart out. But what he's talking about is this, take this spiritual, sinful heart of mine and replace it me with your heart your clean heart, your pure heart. And then he, he, he's reminded what happened to Saul. And so he appeals to God and says, don't cast me away from your presence. You see, David recalls the fact that, that, that Saul has been rejected as, as being king. And so he's pleading with God, please don't cast me away from your presence as you did with Saul. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. See, when God said, Saul, you're no longer going to be king, he took his spirit away from him. And so David is pleading with God, said, in addition to cleansing this heart and bringing me a new heart, please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Don't, don't turn your back on me. I've acknowledged that I have sinned, and I have sinned against you, Father. I'm making no excuses about that. Yes, David realized he, he really messed up. But he makes the appeal the only place it could be. To a God of compassion and love that says, let me lay it all at your feet, and you can cleanse me you can make me whole. You can make me whiter than snow. You can give me this new heart. And you can leave me with your Holy Spirit. 
Next slide, please. Open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. You see, David's laid it all at God's feet, but it didn't stop there. He appeals to God. He says, God, I realize that I still need your salvation. You probably recognize the scripture as the song that was written. And unfortunately, the original version of that actually has one of the verses wrong. It says, Open my heart. Or create in me a new heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Take not your Holy Spirit. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. It wasn't David's salvation. It was God's salvation. God had bestowed salvation on David. And, and, and so he's appealing to David. He said, don't. Don't take that away from me. Keep giving me your salvation. And then he says, there's no earning it. He said, there's no sacrifice that I can give that will earn that salvation. He said, it's a broken and contrite heart. A broken and contrite heart means he lays it all out, and he humbly lays there before God, and he says, I've sinned, I've sinned, I've sinned against you. I have no excuse, but God, I appeal to you to cleanse me once again. Make me whole. Make me have that heart that you originally gave me, a heart after you. And that's what David appeals to. And he says, that's what you won't despise. That's the sacrifice that you'll accept. The sacrifice is one that says, I'm a sinner, I'm in need of your salvation. God, I lay it at your feet with no excuses. You see, this psalm basically is a pattern that you and I should follow when we're confronted with sin. You see, how easy is it for us to, to stand up and when we're confronted with sin and say, oh, it's that person's fault. Oh, that's, if that situation hadn't happened to me, I wouldn't have committed that sin. David didn't do that. He simply said, against you, Lord, I sinned, and only you. And that's, that's what the pattern we should follow when we're confronted with sin. John, in his epistle, first chapter, verse 9, he says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, it's his cleansing. It's his cleansing with the blood of that makes us pure and cleans us from all unrighteousness. And just as David did in his first response, our first response should be to simply say with no excuses, God, I have sinned. And leave it there. God, I have sinned. Not, I have sinned because I have sinned. And when that happens, the blood of Jesus is there to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what the epistle of John talked about when he said, confess your sins. When he's saying, confess your sins, he's not saying, make excuses for your sins, but to simply say, God, I have sinned. 
sin. No reason, no rationalization for it, but just, I have sinned. And just like the blood of cleanse, uh, Jesus cleanses us initially from our sins, so there's nothing we can do to ever earn and keep earning that salvation. It's simply a simple trusting faith and commitment to follow God. And restoration is completed when we come with a broken and contrite heart. I don't know how many people have ever apologized to you and said, oh, I'm sorry for what I did. How many times is it I'm sorry for what I did and got caught? You see, a broken, contrite spirit doesn't say, I'm sorry I got caught. It says, I'm sorry. I sinned. I own it. There's no excuse, God. I have no excuse to stand before you and say, this is why I did that. I chose to sin. You see, that's when God can take that heart and He can cleanse your heart. He can make you whiter than snow. And He can lift you up out of the power of sin. But it's only, it's only when you make that decision to come to Him with no excuses and say, I have sinned. And even though you may feel unworthy, God says, I will make you worthy when you come with a broken and contrite heart. My blood of my Son will be there to cleanse you and to make you whole and to make you worthy. Not because you earn it. Not because you deserve it. But because I want to give it to you. You may be here this morning and, and you've never taken that initial step to reach out and say, God, I want you in my life. I, I, I want you to be the center of my life. I want you to be Lord of my life. I, I, I want to draw on that blood, that cleansing blood. God says, come. Come. Lay your life at my feet. Repent, confess, and die with my son, symbolically, in these water. Rise to live a new life. Or maybe you were once there, and you're like David. You, you chose to follow the path of sin again. God says, come. Come, acknowledge that you've sinned. Come, acknowledge that, that you have broken that relationship with me. And when you come with a broken and contrite heart that goes beyond saying, I'm sorry. It goes beyond saying, oh, I wish I weren't caught. It goes to the point that says, I choose you. I need to change. I want to change. If we can help you in any of those ways, please come as we stand and sing.